G'day, it's Jeff Lewis here from Seriously Series, and welcome to another episode in the Landy Cave. I'll do that again. G'day, it's Jeff Lewis here from Seriously Series. I've been doing a lot of work on the Series 3 lately, and I've finally had a breakthrough. Um, I love these moments when everything comes together. It takes a lot of hard work to get there, but it's well worth it, trust me. One of the breakthroughs that I've had should fix the overheating issues that I've had in this vehicle. And these are actually tips, tricks that you can actually fit to your own series Land Rover and the principles behind it, even if you don't own a Land Rover, will apply to your vehicle too. So stay tuned for another in-depth and informative video. That's right, the viscous fan is finally working. <sighs> Hasn't been easy, I can tell you that now. I've had to pull in a vast array of contacts in order to be able to get this piece of kit actually working, but believe me, it's worth it. And when I test it, particularly with summer coming up here in Australia, I'm gonna be really impressed to see how this goes. So. It's a big hurdle that I've overcome, but there's still a little way to go. We've got to test this properly to make sure that it's actually going to work. To fit a viscous coupling onto your actual vehicle isn't as easy as it sounds, particularly with the Series 3 here. The reason being is the viscous coupling in itself actually takes quite a bit actually fit on. It's not just about simply bolting something straight on. You've actually got to mo modify the water pump and I'll go in depth a little bit more as to what you actually have to do here. You also need a special pulley in order to use on it also and the viscous couplings themselves you can get them but they are a little bit difficult to come by and sadly you can't get new old stock of the actual original uh, Hudson viscous coupling that they used. So sadly, and I know many of you are not a fan of this manufacturer, and believe me, I've been burnt to in the past. Uh, you're not alone there, but I've had to use a brick part viscous coupling, but I bought two viscous couplings. So if this one doesn't work, I've got one as a spare, but it seems to be okay. I had it running in the shed here last weekend and it was around about 40 degrees centigrade and I could hear it whirring away nicely and there was plenty of air running across the motor. But anyway, we'll have a look at what I actually did and what you can do yourself in order to improve your cooling system in your series Land Rover. And it is quite hard, there is a bit that needs to be done, but really in essence, keeping the vehicle as somewhat as pure as you possibly can is really a good way of going about it. Um, going a bit off topic but previous video I did mention how I was particularly keen on going for the viscous coupling over the electric thermofan. Now many of you out there obviously have used electric thermofans yourselves over the years and look I'm not saying that they're a bad thing but what we're doing here isn't necessarily just bolting on the easiest modification known to man. We're trying to use Land Rover parts that realistically could have been used on a 1975 Land Rover Series 3. Now the viscous coupling system that we've got here was available on the two and a quarter litre diesel I believe, don't quote me, 
from 1982 to 1985 seven years after this was built. So this could have been a modification that could have been fitted in the early 1980s. So it's not 100% original, yes I agree, but it could be, it could be. There could be something that was fitted to the vehicle back in the day. But anyway, that's enough of me, get that out of the way. That's enough of me rambling, let's get over to the workbench and find out exactly what I did. Always good to have a little bit of uh, liquid inspiration. Um, single malt whiskey always goes down well. It's a little bit chilly here. We've had a bit of a drop in temperature. So a little bit of antifreeze for the cooling system and for the operator is absolutely vital. Mm. Not bad. So how did I come up with this and how did I figure it out? That's that's probably the first thing to, to actually look at. So a very good friend of mine had an assortment of parts and he said, oh Jeff, I found this odd looking water pump. Um, it might work on your Series 3. You were telling me it was overheating. So anyway, I, I said, oh, how much do you want for it? And he said, oh no, 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 you can have it. So anyway, I put it on Series 3 and it started leaking. As no surprise, many of these second-hand parts that we get are obviously getting coming to the end of their life. It, it pays to uh, actually overhaul them before you put them on, which I've learnt, obviously. So I looked into it a little bit more, and a fantastic Facebook group called, um, I think it's West Oz, and they specialise, oh, this group specialises in series Land Rovers, and I put a photo up there because I'd never seen it before. And a few people uh, commented on it and actually told me roughly what year it was from. And I went back to my um, parts catalogue, which are fantastic. If you haven't got a parts catalogue for your, your FJ Cruiser, your Austin Champ, your Series Land Rover, get one. It makes it so easy. If you're on the phone and you're trying to order a part, all you've got to do is rattle off the original production number and nine times out of ten, nine times out of ten, they'll go, oh yep, got the part, putting it in the post. Instead of spending 15 minutes doing charades while on the phone trying to get them to try and imagine what you're trying to describe. It, it makes life so much easier. It really does. So anyway, I went back to that. I found a part number for the spindle, which is this bit here. And then I found the part number, obviously, which wasn't as hard to find, for a rebuild kit. And obviously, yes, that is not the whole rebuild kit itself. You get more with it than that. So basically, I did that and I figured out that if I got a spindle, which I was able to from a place called All 4x4 Spares in New South Wales, and I got the shaft, then I'd be able to press the spindle onto the shaft. Okay, so theories are great, but putting it into practice is a completely and utterly different game. And that's what I found out. Many people use their Haynes workshop manuals and these are fantastic. If you're starting out and you just want to get a really rough understanding of, you know, um, how do I jack a car up? How do I know what tyre pressure is right in my car? They, they really put it in very, very easy terms to understand. And even if I'm doing something that I've never done before, I'm completely familiar, unfamiliar with, I'll actually go to the Haynes workshop manual and then I'll go to the original Land Rover workshop manual and then go from there. And that means I, you know, have a complete and utter concrete understanding of what is entailed with the task instead of going in there and ballsing it up. Which, okay, I'm not perfect. It does happen from time to time and it does happen to all of us. But the Haynes Workshop Manual is fantastic in that sense at a basic level, but it doesn't have some of the little introsyncrasies that the Land Rover obviously had over its, or the Series 3 had and Series 2 had, over its lifespan, because there's so many different variants. You can't, you can't fit it all into, you know, a 110 page manual. It's not possible. You know, these cars have like a 
two volume manual you, you, you wouldn't even dream of getting that for a um, new 70 series cruiser or even the new Defender that's come out, it won't even come with that you, you'd probably try and put it on the Bluetooth speaker and it'll fail because it's probably still Lucas Electrics but anyway that's beside the point so I went, I went there, there wasn't anything in, in it in regards to this I then went to the original Series 3 workshop manual which I actually got off a friend of mine and we kind of co-care for the manual you could say and that was actually out of a Series 3 that was bought back in the 70s and that has absolutely everything so that mentioned obviously the spindle uh, the spindle how to actually do the water pump because there's a few extra tolerances and all the rest that you need to take into account when you actually do the water pump and really the, the key one is obviously how far do you press the spindle onto the actual shaft itself and I actually found that the shaft that came out of it it, it was actually incorrect it, instead of being here it was up about half an inch more the reason why you have to get this done properly is because the pulley then sits on here and if you can imagine if this is the engine block and then you've got your alternator down here if this is sitting all the way out there then your belt's going to be on an angle and it's going to, it's not going to wear correctly so you have to get it perfectly in line so that's something you need to check out if you're going to do it yourself um, I think it's Aurora Land Rover Forum is probably your best bet I, I would recommend checking out them they're fantastic um, so that's that's what I had to overcome there the next thing was that sadly I don't have a press so I had to try and do it in the vise which worked out okay. Once I did that I then had to try and figure out actually how to rebuild the water pump itself and I haven't done that before um, so that was a learning curve also. The biggest thing with a water pump is getting the seal here to actually sit properly inside it. This sits on the shaft like so there and then you have an uh, impeller which sits on here and I'll, I'll show you that in greater detail later on in the video but basically what you need to do is you need to get the right amount of preload or pressure actually on the seal itself because as you can see it's actually spring loaded now too much you'll damage the seal too little water's going to get through so that's 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 quite hard and I admit I actually blew a few seals before I actually got it right. The other problem is, is that when you actually put it onto the car, or in, actually put the water pump onto the actual motor itself, the next thing you want to do is obviously put the radiator in. I would say don't do that. Many people would disagree. I would say don't do that. Uh, I did it, and what happened? Water ran out the bottom of the water pump and I'll actually get a water pump now and I'll show you what I mean. Right, so here is a standard water pump for a two and a quarter litre uh, petrol engine. Under here, you can see there's a little hole. Now, the seal that I was talking about here sits basically just in there, like so, or probably about there and sits around that way like that okay so if that doesn't actually seal properly then this is sitting like so the hole is in the bottom here what's going to happen water's going to come out that's right so I put everything back together on the car put the, the radiator in obviously all the hoses and I'm like great let's fire it up and even before I did that I spun the actual uh, water pump a few times and water just came straight out and I was like man I'd wasted all that time putting the radiator in and getting everything ready so what I actually did uh, is when I went to do it again I took the hoses off and in the lower outlet this one here put a heap of rags in there and a screwdriver and just rammed it in not all the way through to the impeller and that is an impeller there as you can see 
It's not a propeller, it's an impeller, because it goes in, I guess you could say. But I put rags in here. Now by putting rags in there, that was enough to stop the water actually coming out. And I could then actually get a jug of water and fill up the actual jacket in the motor right up to the thermostat housing. Now by doing that, I could then spin the water pump over by hand and I could check if that seal was actually working. And lo and behold it did as you saw earlier in the video. And then by that, if it didn't work, I then wouldn't have to take the radiator out, the hoses and all the rest. So that, that's a trick that I learnt. That's a trick that I learnt, very much so. So anyway, we'll go back over to the, uh, the Land Rover and uh, we'll have a bit closer look because there's a couple other things that I've changed there too. <coughs> Okay, so one of the other things that I actually did with the Series 3 is I didn't want to take any risks when it came to actually doing the cooling system. And look, if you want to use these vehicles for travelling as we do and you want to go to remote areas, it comes to a point where you really can't cut costs. Um, I know many, many people out there don't have the money to do a full resto from top to bottom and you know I've been there myself but there's certain things that you can cut corners on and there's certain things you can't and having a good cooling system particularly here in Australia makes a big big difference so this radiator before you start typing in the comments section is obviously out of a series 2 spot on it is not out of a series 3 correct the reason why this radiator is in this car is because I found it incredibly hard to actually get a Series 3 radiator. The other problem is, is that to actually get one recalled at a reasonable price where I'm situated was incredibly expensive. So this actually got done uh, in Tasmania and brought over by a friend of mine. So basically what they do when they recall a radiator is they take this top part here off. This is known as the tank. They take the bottom part off too, and they put brand new cores actually inside the radiator. These are the parts that you'll notice in the front and back of the radiator that have the fins. Now, this is where the air flows through. When the air flows through, what does it do? It cools it down, or, or we hope so. What happens over time is inside the radiator, it gets you know, mud and rust and all these other issues that actually clog them up and they become less and less effective. So one thing you can get done is you can actually get the top tank taken off and you can actually get your core cleaned out. But I believe if you're going that far you might as well get the whole thing redone. So we've got a brand spanking new radiator in here. New radiator hoses top and bottom. They were new anyway but and it's good to replace them anyway. Now I know everything's okay. I run glycol coolant in it. If you're true and utter purist, you'll put distilled water in it and you'll forget about putting any alcohol-based coolant in it. But um, really, I think if you're doing that, then if, you know, you're probably doing more harm to the motor than good. So that's basically pretty much it. There's not a lot to see from this point of view. But as I said, I didn't really want to particularly go for an oil cooler. And I've explained why in a previous video, but just to touch on that, there's such a climatic difference here in the goldfields of Western Australia. In the middle of winter, overnight it can get down as far as minus one. In summer, in the daytime, it can obviously reach and well and truly exceed 50 degrees centigrade. So I needed something that was going to be able to regulate itself, and it's a bit of a stretch to say this of a viscous coupling, but I needed a larger fan that could move a greater amount of air over the motor to cool it down in the hotter months, and I needed something that would be able to almost switch off or not be used as excessively in those cooler months too. So having an oil cooler, yes, would work fine. I could simply put a muff over it, but these kits are very expensive from what I've, the research I've done you're looking at around about nine hundred dollars or nine hundred and fifty close to a thousand dollars australian which is around about five hundred pounds or four hundred and fifty pounds which is a you know it's a small fortune 
this here has actually cost a lot less. Um, the viscous couplings go for around about $200 to around about sort of close to the $300 mark Australian. So you're looking at around about 100 to 150 pounds. The spindle itself, obviously this one was a custom job. It was machined up by hand. So it cost a bit more. It was around uh, $100 Australian, so 50 pounds. The water pump rebuild kits are very, very cheap. Um, I used a, a Bear Mark one on this and that was about $20 Australian. So about 10 pounds. So for all, all up, if you're looking at you know $200 for the viscous coupling, um, you're looking at you know $100 for the spindle, you're looking at about $20 for the rebuild kit, $220, maybe say $320 is probably more realistic because the viscous couplings can cost more. You've got the problem pretty much sorted or you've got an effective means of being able to have a better chance of regulating the actual temperature of your motor um, in, a, in a warmer or more dynamic climate. So um, compared to the $900 or the $1000 that I was going to have to look at spending on an oil cooler, um, I think this is a pretty good little way of getting around it and I certainly got very excited when I first sort of came across the idea of being able to do this and it's something quite unique and we are about making these vehicles uh, a little bit special and unique here at Seriously Series. But look, I hope you've enjoyed this video. This is something that you yourself can do on your own Land Rover or pretty much any vehicle. Um, if you're looking at sort of upgrading or giving the cooling system a little bit more of a freeze or a bit more of an edge, um, you can certainly do it yourself. Now, if you are interested in doing this to your series Land Rover, be sure to st stick around at the end of this video because down in the content section, I'm actually going to put all the part numbers, the Land Rover part numbers, that I use to actually get these parts. So you yourself can actually go through, you can have a look at them, and I'll even put the website where I actually got majority of my parts to actually do this modification um, from. So be sure to check that out. Also, if you haven't picked up your Seriously Series merchandise, be sure to check out the web link in the content section below at, for Seriously Series clothing. And there's a lot more than just clothing there. But look, as always, thank you for watching this video. I really hope you've enjoyed it. And if it's your first time coming across Seriously Series, please click on the subscribe button down below. And if you really enjoy our videos and you want to see more behind the scenes and all the rest, please click on the Patreon icon, which is at the top right-hand corner of your screen. And I hope to catch you in our next video.